Good morning, good day, um, whichever time zone you're joining us from. Um, welcome, very, a very warm welcome to our webinar today, uh, looking at the International Lower Secondary Examiner Feedback. Um, so for today's session, you have myself. My name is Jo Newton Stone, and uh, I'm the Chief Examiner as you can see on the slide, for both the international primary and the lower secondary uh, examination and curriculum. And um, my colleague, Anne Basden, is also with me today. Just a really quick introduction to myself, if you've not met me before, either in training or in person. My background is that I'm a teacher. I've been a teacher for many, many years. Gosh, 35 plus and counting, um, but also extensive examining experience. I think working with Pearson Ed Excel for some more than 25 years, I guess. And um, also I have the pleasure of training, as I previously mentioned, with the international uh, primary and lower secondary curriculum. So sometimes I have a wonderful privilege of uh, being with you face to face, um, traveling to some beautiful places to see some wonderful colleagues. And um, also I have uh, the pleasure of training people online as well. So that's me. Um, Anne, would you like to just uh, introduce yourself, please? Morning. Um, yes, I'm Anne Basden. I'm chair of the IPLSC um, programme. Um, it's a privilege to work with you all. And I'm looking forward to today. I don't really have very much to say about me. Um, will that do, Joe? That will do. Yes, we're we're very uh, pleased that you can join us, Anne. And Anne's been. Um, uh, we've been working. Well, we've been working together for quite some years now, haven't we, Anne? And uh, it's uh, it's always uh, wonderful to have. Anne's experience, expertise. Loads uh, of years, loads of years. In the process, yes. So, <laughs> <laughs> right, so um, without further ado then, um, let's let's begin, shall we? So, okay, let me just uh, get organised here. So, um, so in today's session then, we just, we have one hour together. Um, yesterday I was working with the iPrimary colleagues and we actually found that um, the session did run over a little bit, but I do understand with your timetable, if you need to dash off um, exactly, you know, um, at the end, then please feel free to leave. But I'm very happy, Anne's very happy to stick around, um, you know, if people need to chat, ask questions and so on. There will be some time, as we can see on these uh, this session outcome here, right at the end, for questions and answers. But before we get there, um, we want to, we thought it would be really actually useful to give you an overview of the writing and content production process that Anne and I go through um, in order to produce the examination papers that your candidates, your students uh, take in um, English. So um, by the assessment, I'm referring to the achievement test, um, typically taken by students, by candidates who are in year nine. Um, sometimes that's referred to as grade eight. So the uh, 14 years old. Now, um, just to just to mention very quickly here, in case I forget later, the it is possible for students to take that examination a little bit later. They can be 15, they can be 16, or indeed they can be younger, depending on when you think it is appropriate for them to enter. So it doesn't, they don't have to have to be 14 years old. Okay, so then moving on, we're going to be looking at the marking process um, because we know that you're extremely dedicated to your students. You work incredibly hard, as do they. And for our part, and as teachers and professionals ourselves, it's really important to us that um, the marking process is structured so that it is extremely um, high of a high quality standard. It's extremely accurate and consistent for your students to get the marks and the grades that they deserve. Um, specifically today, we're going to be looking at the um, principle, the LEH 11 principal examiner feedback report 
from 2310. So let me just unpick that. When I say 2310, it's referring to 2023, October. So last October's examination. Um, ev after every examination, the principal examiner does have to produce a report and we try to make that as useful as possible um, for you to pick up tips for the future and so on. Um, we're also going to be looking at um, uh, talking about tips. We're going to be looking about uh, at how we can use feedback uh, from those reports to support future candidates. Now, this is going to be very much an overview session, and I do apologise. Um, usually when I'm doing training, I do like to do lots of activities and things like that, but this is generally an overview session, so I will be doing quite a bit of talking and explaining, but um, Anne and I are very hopeful that this is just the first of um, things to come. So we're hoping to extend and expand upon what we talk about today into um, activities that we can all join in and we can get a better idea of ways to support our candidates, our students. OK, so as I say, questions and answers at the end. Um, if um, if you do, you know, just make a note of things or pop them in the chat box and I'll try and get get to them when when I can. First of all, let's think about who is who. So from our side, who is who? The various roles and responsibilities. There are actually is actually a very um, quite a, um, a, a very specific team that is responsible each and every one of us for producing those robust papers. So. Let's start with the assessment leader. Now, the assessment leader is a Pearson Edexcel manager who coordinates and also, um, you know, organises the contracting of examiners at all levels, arranging important things like dates for meetings, dates for the whole of the examining uh, process and the marking cycle. Everything from training sessions to getting timely results back to schools the content coordinator. Now, this person uh, is who we work with specifically to ensure that the examination papers are commissioned and written. Now, this actually um, can be done many months in advance. For example, um, I've been receiving emails asking me, Joe, could you could you write, um, could you put together an achievement test for us for I primary or I lower secondary that's going to be taken in June or October? 2026 so we're really talking far ahead and the reason for that is because writing a paper and checking that paper and putting it through lots of quality assurance tests um uh, sorry processes stages actually can take up to 30 months in itself so we do need a lot of time there's a rigorous 10 step process which i'll talk to you about uh, very shortly but let's move on to the chair and her role so um anne uh, has introduced herself um mrs basden and she is our chair she is um very very senior in terms of experience really highly experienced as we've already said and she is responsible for overviewing the whole process of both primary and lower secondary achievement test papers. So she's got that eagle eye on every single detail, every single tiny detail um, in terms of uh, comparisons and quality and consistency. And uh, myself, um, as I introduced myself at the beginning, um, there is... Uh, the role of the chief examiner, which I fulfil. So I'm looking after the uh, year six, grade five, uh, year nine, grade eight achievement tests also in a similar role. But um, I'm also the principal examiner for year six, which means that specifically I um, am uh, responsible during the marking process for um for looking after my examining team, training them, and so on. So it's all about making things consistent. Um, so in terms of um, writing, marking, level threshold setting from year to year, 
Um, currently, I'm actually writing examination papers for both uh, achievement tests, for both year six and year nine. Let's think about the principal examiner. So there are two examiners. I am principally the principal examiner for year six, grade five. And we also have um, a colleague, again, very highly experienced, who is the year nine um, principal examiner. And unfortunately, she can't be with us today, but uh, we hope that you can uh, meet her in future future trainings. So um, our role as principal examiners is to prepare training and quality assurance materials for training our team so that they are going to deliver the best, the most accurate, consistent grades and results for your students. And last but not least, uh, we have an English subject specialist and we are really delighted to have her working with our papers because she is highly respected and regarded at a national level in the UK. She is working for the Department for Education, for national testing, and she, we are, as I say, we're so delighted that she is available for us to advise us on all aspects of putting the papers together, the con ensuring that the content is absolutely tip top and accurate and uh, she's an absolute treasure. Okay, so a really strong team and lots of people with, with dedicated roles. What we're going to be doing uh, just in the next uh, part of the process is actually having a look at how we actually produce those papers in a little bit more detail. Now, as I said, it's a 10 step process. It can take anything up to um, 30 months. Usually we try to do it, you know, in 12 months for a particular paper, extremely robust. So let's have a look at this, the 10 step process. OK, so just for being uh, concise, I have uh, split these stages uh, just into four main steps, as we can see here. but. The key point, as it says on the slide there, is that security and confidentiality are absolutely integral to the process. We do use a secure portal to share our documents with uh, key stakeholders. We never, ever, ever email anything as important and as confidential as a potential examination paper by email. It's got to be on the secure portal. So let's just quickly focus on stages one to two. The writer is commissioned, so in that case, in my case at the moment, for both year six and year nine, commissioned to select appropriate reading texts for the source booklet and also to produce, to actually write the question paper and the mark scheme. Now, this, I can't emphasize this enough, the paper, uh, I have really strict guidelines. I'm given uh, really strict guidelines by Pearson Edexcel about how I must put my paper together. The paper must contain a specified number of questions to ensure that all ability ranges are included from S1 through S2, S3, S4, all of these children at these particular ability points will be targeted to show their skills. There are strict instructions about the assessment objectives, which I'll talk a little bit more about um, shortly. A specified amount of different objectives must be covered in questions. These are detailed in your mark schemes that are published to schools. So you will see each question with, um, and it will say RAO, and it will be a number from one to five, reading assessment objective one to five. So um, further details about these assessment objectives can be found in the International Lower Secondary, the ILS specification document. And what I've actually done is I've popped in the documents area um, to um uh, for, for you to download these uh, these specific things. So if you haven't already, before we close the meeting, um, do attend to that. But as I say, it's most important to to kind of join join in with the session just right now. Don't worry about that if you haven't done it already. Okay, so um, the first 
draft of the paper will be then reviewed by the uh, chair of examiners, by Anne, and also by the subject specialist that I mentioned. Moving on to stage three, this is a formal meeting and it's a whole day that's hosted by the Pearson assessment leader and content coordinator. Also attending is the principal examiner, the chair, the chief, and the subject specialists. And we all go through bit by bit, every single thing, starting with the texts and each question and its accompanying mark scheme to check that everything is sensible, robust, fair, and accurate according to the intended level of difficulty and that particular assessment objective. Moving on to stages four to eight. So in this process, following this expert committee meeting at stage three, all components of the paper are examined by other experienced consultants, both to scrutinize and comment on the question paper, mark schemes and texts, but also to proofread all content and make sure that the house writing style protocols are adhered to. Last but not least, um, I love the little logo of uh, running over the finishing line, getting there. So stages nine to 10, this is where the chair, the chief examiner and the principal examiner review all of the consultant checks that have taken place at stages four to eight. And then, and only then when we're completely, completely 110% happy, do we issue a final sign off of that paper. And at that point, uh, the paper is configured by Pearson ePen specialists because um, although your students, your candidates will take their paper, their, their examination on paper, and you will post that back, it's actually marked online by ourselves. So it has to be configured for the ePen setup. So as you can see, this process is extremely detailed. It's extremely secure, robust rigorous to ensure that candidates have a highly positive experience and have the best opportunity to demonstrate their skills and achievement in those tests. And now we're going to look at the marking process itself. So we're going to, uh, having all this, um, take, this has been taken place, you know, many months before, We've written the paper, we've checked it. Now we come to the actual um, getting very near the time of the examination process. So what we're going to have a, uh, have a look at just now is how we prepare for and how, you know, what things that we do during the marking process and what we do afterwards. So preparing to mark. As you can see, there are four main areas. I'm just going to say a little bit about each. So first of all, contracting the markers. Now, the assessment leader presents a list of prospective markers to the chair, the chief and the principal examiner for approval. And because we've been doing our jobs for a long time, we've met a lot of wonderful examiners on the way. And um, we um, effectively handpick our markers that we know have got, uh, they are proven in successful, being successful teachers, successful examiners. But crucially, we're talking about the lower secondary paper here. It's really important that we have uh, examiners who are experienced with teaching and examining students who are around uh lower secondary, grade eight, year nine. So um, we select, uh, sorry, moving on to selecting training materials. The principal examiners, once the examinations have been uh, taken, then those are couriered back to the UK. Everything is scanned in online on ePen. And uh, my first job as principal examiner is to go through and to have a look at live candidate responses. And from those, um, I spend an awful lot of time looking at each different question, looking at the range of answers against the mark scheme, and just, just seeing um, how things are being received by, have been received by the candidates. And from there, 
I will select a pack of training materials because it's really important for me to make sure that my markers can respond and, and grade your students for each question appropriately. Okay, so um, in terms of um, uh, pre-standardization meetings, we've got two whole days where we schedule where the principal examiner presents her, in this case, it's um, two females um, doing the uh, I ILS and the IP um, uh, examinations. So we present each of us our selected responses with our proposed marks for those responses to the chair. Every response is thoroughly discussed before we all as a committee agree and approve those marks so that we've all got that really clear and detailed understanding of what we're looking for to award our marks to the students. Once that has taken, those two days have taken place, then we have uh, the training and standardizing of markers. Now this is again, a whole day, but this is for the team of markers that we have handpicked and selected. So the principal examiner will present the reading text, the question paper, the mark scheme, and she will train them how they must apply marks in the given training examples. Now, as part of this meeting, the markers do have a test and they must pass with a high standard, the standardization test to ensure that we are happy that they are, when they go to where, uh, go away on ePen and they're given their selected um, scripts to mark, that they do this accurately for all reading and writing, the writing question. Okay, so we've trained the markers, off they go, they get busy on ePen. What happens then? The marking process, it lasts around um, three weeks. And there is a lot of ongoing quality assurance. And I'm just going to run through that with you because there are quite a lot of things that we do um, to make sure that that uh, process of accuracy continues. So what do we do first? We do, valid we, we do something called, uh, we select validity items. So, the, uh, this is done as a panel of the um, the expert uh, markers, such as the principal examiner, the chief and the chair. We, as a committee, select uh, validity items that we, uh, for every question, that we give a mark to, and we've agreed a mark, a correct mark. And these are secretly put into the system, if you like. So what will happen is, that um, every, um, I think it's done on the basis of every one in 20 uh, responses that um, uh, an examiner marks, they will receive secretly, they will not know it is a validity item, but they it will be put into their marking and they will give it a mark as, as usual. And then that is matched against what the actual mark should be, what the true score should be. So this is how we check that markers are keeping to the standards. So we, we look at all those results very carefully. Also, you know, apart from the automated system of validities, we do something called back reading, which means that we sample throughout the whole of the marking period, the beginning, the middle, and towards the end, um, we sample a proportion of each marker's work. If we do spot an error, the mark is changed so that the student gets the correct mark and the marker is provided with both verbal and written feedback so that that error will not occur again. And then um, just to say as well, uh, the examiners are really, really conscientious and sometimes they will get unusual responses from candidates. So rather than kind of taking a guess and thinking, oh, I'm not really sure what to do with this, it's not in the mark scheme, what they will do is they will put it into review. So I will go and uh, visit my ePen inbox and uh, on a daily basis and uh, as a principal, and I will look at those and discuss them, um, message the marker and um, 
and make recommendations as to what mark those responses should receive. And also because of all this, um, you know, kind of automation, everything being online, EPEN um, is able to, the Pearson staff are able to use EPEN statistics to be able to generate uh, reports to give feedback to myself and to Anne, the chair, about the accuracy of the whole of a marker's work in relation to things like validities and back reading samples. So no stone is left unturned in this process. So what happens afterwards? The marking has finished. Now, the first thing is that the markers are provided with a feedback grade, which will determine if we want or if they may be reappointed in future. And that all depends on the quality of their performance during marking, as you can see already that we've uh, already been very vigilant for. The level threshold setting process. So this is um, where we um, are given a lot of statistics by the uh, by Pearson um, and we look at papers from previous examinations so we we call those the archive scripts and we also compare them in terms of standards and um, performance with uh, this year's papers so we do a lot of looking at different candidates whole papers and comparing those standards and this all supports uh, the agreed, uh, the process where we agree during this level uh, threshold setting, what pass mark is going to be for S1, which is the lowest grade of ILS, as you, I'm sure you know, S2, S3 and S4. So the pass marks in effect. And then I just want to say a little bit, just really quickly about the results plus resources. Now, this is a unique service that Pearson, as an exam board, Pearson Edexcel provide to enable uh, you as uh, teachers to number crunch and filter your results for independent. So you can you can have a look um, rather than kind of old style. I remember when when I was doing this with my students, I'd get my examination papers back and I'd be having a look. Oh gosh, you know how have they performed? in their writing, how have they performed with this question or that question or this assessment objective? And this really does the hard work for you because you can you can look at results for individual candidates, uh, individual questions and how your, your candidates performed against them. You can um, even look across different cohorts, last year's cohorts compared to this. And you can even, although it's anonymous as it indeed it should be, you can even look at other centres in your country or across the world and compare yourself with how your students are doing um, in relation to everybody else. Finally, the PE report. So um, we're going to be talking about that next, but, um, oh, sorry, um, inquiries about results. Okay, we, sorry, I've missed that. Uh, we call that the EAR process, inquiries about results. So. Once your papers are returned to you, we never send the pack of papers back. It's always the electronic PDF uh, documents. They uh, Schools can check through the candidate's work. And should you deem it necessary, centres may request an official review of the awarded marks for the entire paper. So if you're looking at a particular candidate and thinking, oh, okay, I'm looking at this question and that question, and I'm not really sure if that's um, if, if that mark um, is reflected in that, in that response. If you really um, have a genuine concern about that, then you can send it back. And um, it is always, always looked at by a, a senior examiner, either myself or Anne, or the uh, principal examiner for, um, for lower secondary. OK, so um, finally, the P uh, PE report, written feedback to centres. Now, I've put your report in the documents area uh, written by my colleague um, who was PE for, uh, for the ILS paper. And its purpose is both to congratulate candidates 
um, and also to support, you know, looking at areas of improvement, you know, looking at strengths, but also identifying some, you know, maybe trends that we've noticed, some weaker areas that maybe um, it might be necessary for, for teachers to work on to support future candidates. So that whole report is available in the um, in the resources area. Moving on to the um, the said report, uh, as I said, we're going to look specifically at feedback from uh, last October. So where relevant, we're going to make references perhaps to some other questions from some other series. Um, just to be clear, you probably know this anyway, but just to be clear, um, the, the, there are examination, there are achievement tests for both IP and ILS that um, you can that your students can enter for June. And then there is another sitting, another series of examinations available for October. Typically, October has much lower numbers. Now, sometimes candidates who've taken the examination in June, perhaps they were absent, perhaps maybe they, they were feeling a little bit poorly that day and didn't do as well as you'd expected them to do. They can actually resit and take it in October. Um, but um, often the October paper is also taken by um, schools whose school year actually ends in December. So, um, you know, there's, there's there are specific reasons that we've added that series there. OK, so let's let's begin to uh, go through then. So we'll start with the reading texts first. Um, with the uh, this particular theme for this year was focused on expeditions. I've also put the uh, for your convenience in the resources area. I've put your question paper and source booklet as well. Um, so uh, this this particular one was um, it was looking at um, uh, the Arctic exploration of the Arctic. Uh, Contiki, I believe, and then um, a fiction. So um, we have two non-fiction texts and one fiction text in the secondary paper. Now, unlike primary, this is not pre-released. We are expecting, um, if the children are typically taking this examination, at age 14 years old, although they don't have to be, as I said before, typically we would expect them to be of such a standard of English to actually encounter the reading texts and the questions on the same day. OK. Let's just just move on a little bit here. Um, I want to mention to you about um, the reading assessment objectives, these can be found in your specification document, which is in the resources area. Just going to go quiet for a few seconds, just that it, they are very, very similar, but there are some tiny, tiny differences, but um, not not um, not too, um, uh, too, too much. But have a look um, at the secondary reading assessment objectives. And you'll remember that I mentioned that I'm under strict um, instructions that I must include um, a specific range of um, uh, these assessment objectives into my pa question papers and designated amounts of marks in every single paper, which is ensuring the consistency there. So. I think it's really important, and I, I said this yesterday to our primary colleagues as well, I think it's really, really important as a teacher to 
get the students familiar with these. Although it doesn't actually say on the question, this is an uh, reading assessment objective one question, you can um, you can start to, once you become very familiar with them and once you share them with the students, you can start to pick up on what, um, you know, with the wording of the questions, some little clues about what is being assessed. And certainly with my students in the past, when I'm preparing them for various examinations, I have shared the information and I've got them familiar. So I would do something like, I'm gonna share with you on the next slide. I would do some kind of matching activities, a little bit of active learning there. So what I would do is chop up these uh, assessment objectives, uh, make several packs of them. And I would go to some past papers and I would select um, various different ones and look at the wording of the questions and see if we can deduce, see if we can start to match together, whether we think it's, uh, I've just got an example of three of them on here, an example of uh, REO3 or four or five in this case. So looking at the top one, features of text, we can see that that is going to match with REO3. I'm just gonna, as I say, give you a few seconds just to take that in and have a look at these. Reading assessment objective five can be quite a challenge for the students because it's all about, as we can see here, the writer's purposes and viewpoints, the writer's purposes and the overall effect of the text on the reader. So we've got an example here. It's really amazing. So that's a quote from, um, I think that was the summer paper, that was the June paper. It's really amazing. Why does the writer tell us that Oslo uses the words really amazing? So it's about acknowledging that the writer has made that specific choice to put those words. So um, we can get a clue to the, as to the REO uh, if it's making reference to the writer there. Um, so getting, as I say, with these matching exercises, it can be really useful. It can be, you know, it's a fun and active activity. Um, and even, you know, I've put at the top there, can they write their own? Um, we talk about the potential to do some future training. And these are the kinds of things that um, we, uh, we could engage in together in our training. So we could have a look at some REOs and say, okay, let's, uh, let's have a go at, uh, constructing some REO5 questions or REO3, um, and so on. So it's really looking at those keywords that might give away which REO it's matched to. Okay. I'm just going to give you as a, uh, a few seconds to look at our analysis of October's paper. Looking at the statistics, this these were our findings. There are, obviously there's a lot to take in here. We are going to look specifically at some examples. So, um, you know, nobody can hold these questions in their head and think, okay, um, you know, oh, I remember that question. So uh, for your convenience uh, and for reflecting on after our session, um, I've put in the documents area, the, uh, the PowerPoint. So this is slide 14. You may wish to just take a little, uh, screenshot of this um, on your smartphone or something like that. And um, then you can go to the questions and the source booklet that I've put in the resources to look in more detail. Okay, but this is our analysis based on the uh, statistics of uh, performance. 
So from this, I'm just going to please, you know, if you get um if you if you would like to just pop in the chat box, what you know, what would you say are the easier in general, the easier reading assessment objectives? What's what is standing out to you from these results here? What would you say are the easier ones? So just in the chat box. Okay, so Devika, REO2. Yeah, Helen, Helen is in agreement with that. So that's the one. Um, yeah, quite a lot of questions there, although there were a couple that were really tricksy, weren't there? But uh, certainly they're doing really well there. What would you say, conversely, what would you say seems to be more challenging? Some responses here, so let's have a look. So, are you for word and sentence level now? Interestingly, the uh, in I primary yesterday actually, are you for was answered really well, but they do don't forget they do have the um the ability to look at the pre released uh source booklets, are you for. Vocabulary, it can be, of course, for our EAL students, it can be really challenging. Um, but yes, in this uh, particular case, it was uh, we we found this so interesting. Lots and lots of uh, questions here based on that. So with... Sorry, Jay, can I just interrupt? Yes, in please. Four, it was often two mark questions and the children only achieved one mark so they could get the very basics of it but they couldn't go beyond that um it was a very noticeable trend thank you Anne. a good point so hopefully we'll be able to see that in a couple of examples that we've picked out um as we come to them now the pe report uh i have put it in the resources section it is available on um qual let me write the website they are available on qualifications.pearson.com let me just write that down i'm sure you're really aware of this website anyway uh your examinations officer will if you log in as a school then you come out of the public area and you will actually be able to um, some things are, are padlocked in the public area because the students can access them as well. So we obviously don't want them accessing things that you might be using for mock practice examinations. But if you if you get logged in, you will be able to find the PE reports. And um, with regard to that, I can't stress enough that everything, you know, these questions are discussed in detail and the reasons, you know, the performance and the the kind of the issues, the problems that candidates might have had, but also what can be done to kind of rectify that. So it is a really important guide to current trends. And these trends can really differ a lot from series to series. It's really surprising. OK, so we're going to have a look at the lovely six mark question, question 13 in this paper. Uh, if we just go back here, question 13, there it is, uh, sitting in REO4, but also in REO5 and REO2. It is a very valuable high tariff question, six marks, the biggest, uh, the most in the examination paper. As you can see, the REOs uh, that are awarded, the reading assessment objectives, it is for the inference and deduction, two marks, also available are the uh, for the language and exploring the evidence and um, the use of quotations and things like that in, in an appropriate way. And REO5, the purposes of the writer. 
So most candidates did, as we can see here, found it very difficult to answer. In this particular case, it it is bet it was better in other series. So it's not the case that every year candidates find this hard, but in this particular case, the reasons are on the slide. I'm going to be quiet, <laughs> just let you take that information in and look at the question itself. Jobo, just remind me at the end, please, if you wouldn't mind. Um, so this was the, as I say, it was particularly challenging this series, but um, in terms of, you know, for the reasons provided here, um, it was, it's about the contrast between the two, uh, between the two sentences from both texts. And as you can see in this case with this question, unfortunately, lots of the candidates did write about one or the other. It's important to note as well, some students can give some really articulate answers, make some really, really good points, but they're unfortunately, you know, like for reading between the lines inference, we can only award a maximum of two marks. So if they're not kind of hitting the spot with the other reading assessment objectives, we can't do anything about that. Okay. Questions 15 and 21, both two marks for REO2 and REO4. I'm going to just let you take that information in. I'm going to go quiet. This, this again might be useful, although you've got the, the whole PowerPoint, this might be useful to, um, to take a screenshot of perhaps, if you didn't want to plow through the whole, the whole thing. Um, so as Anne pointed out actually, uh, very helpfully just uh, previously, many candidates did obtain one mark because they could reference the speed of the events. Um, as they were happening, but very, very few were able to go further to gain the second mark that showed understanding that even though things were actually happening really, really quickly, it actually felt like it was a longer time. So it's about that contrast. It's not just, you know, kind of on a very superficial level referring to the events, the slowness of one bit or the quickness of another. It's about putting those two together. And question 21 about the boulders are not ankle breakers, they're femur breakers. Again, many obtained one mark for stating that the boulders were harmful in some way. Very few were able to contrast the boulders in relation to the size of them being capable of breaking much larger bones, never mind the smaller ones like the ankle bone. So it's the it's the contrasting and the comparisons and, and things like that. And I think rather than students going through and just doing lots and lots of practice, practicing, you know, maybe the last five um, examinations as a mark or something like that, it's probably better to be a bit smarter 
with going in and selecting more challenging questions and working collaboratively to look at how we can we can put those together and what the right you know what the question is asking us and how we can construct a fuller answer okay so this is um another question question 20 i'll give you some seconds to have a look at this slide So as we, you know, going right back to the matching exercise, you know, the clue is in the question. It's about the writer and they are really important in this. And it could be implicit. Um, you know, they might not say, well, the writer tells us this because they want to, you know, they might just say to show us or um, to let us know or they they mean or something like that. So we, we we are very, very positive where we possibly can be about that reference to the writer. So no authorial intent if they're not mentioning the writer. That was that was the difficulty in this question. And um, really, I think just to sum up uh, before we move on, a careful reading of the question, um, perhaps highlighting the word all. It is it, it came up as a question yesterday. The students, the candidates can highlight their source booklet, they can highlight their examination paper as long as it doesn't cover up the answer that they've written, because obviously we need to read it. They can use that paper and highlight it and mark it and underline keywords um, to, uh, to support them. That's absolutely fine. Okay, so let's now um, just move on and think about um, how we can improve our reading responses. So very similar here to uh, what we were talking about yesterday. Um, do they read English texts by choice? What do they read? How do you source your texts? Do you read aloud to your class? Just some rhetorical questions there for you to think about. It's really important. I know it's a really busy curriculum and uh, we've all been there trying to do as many things as possible in a short lesson time, but reading aloud to the students is a really powerful uh, exercise because it means it's inclusive and everybody can share in that ex experience and do oral comprehension. So the next point. Have a look at some responses to questions from a student in another class or a previous year candidate. You can keep them anonymous. We don't want to, um, you know, kind of embarrass anybody, obviously. Um, we can have the ILS mark scheme and discuss responses to understand why they were given the marks they got by the examiner. So in this case, mark candidate responses. The teacher will copy genuine examples um, of other students' responses, obviously anonymously, without the marks being shown. So we'll say, OK, this was what um, Hassan uh, wrote. Um, obviously, not the real name, but this is what student A wrote in last year's paper to this question. Uh, look, here's the mark scheme. Have a go with your talk partner. What do you think, if you were the examiner, what marks would you give that? And then you can re reveal the actual marks that they got. And um, that can be quite a fun thing because it's getting them to look, um, it's getting them to scrutinize and look and pay attention to detail and, um, you know, to justify why they've given the marks. So I just think that that's really helpful rather than just doing lots and lots of practice of difficult questions that we might still not be able to do if we weren't given that scaffold. And again, up level 
poorly answered responses. So if a mark has got zero, you know, think about that six mark question. How can we up level uh, this response? Um, why did they only get one mark or two marks? Um, do they need to do more Oreo 5? Have they compared and contrasted across both texts? Things like that. So having a go uh, in that way. And um, again, peer marking our own responses, um, having a go and up-leveling our own, applying the skills that we've learned in the previously suggested activities. And again, you know, little and often, three little words. Um, I think it's important just to stress that that's more effective than plowing through endless papers. Um, we can't, we're not going to make the students better by doing 100 past papers um, and just keep doing the same and repeating the same mistakes. What we are going to make them better by is picking out very carefully the areas of those papers that we can do useful active learning activities to support them with. So some key tips. We've mentioned this. It's fine. Talked about REO5. Now, this was an interesting one uh, specific to this last October paper. Um, the purpose of a range of text features. So um, students often, for example, get confused between dashes and hyphens. And, um, you know, ju just as a top of my head um, thing, obviously read the PE report for more details, but features of text, um, the purpose of punctuation, the purpose of things like in parentheses, brackets or um, dashes or commas, whatever, that is really, I think that would be really important to cover and using the past papers to look for keywords in questions. So um, I've mentioned the website. We have uh, that website to, to look at in that case. Right, very quickly, moving on to the writing task. It was a diary entry recounting an interesting event about an expedition that you may have been on. And of course, that could be real or imaginary. These are the writing assessment objectives. There are just two in secondary. So we're looking at um, really uh, the adaptation to the genre, to the tasks, the audience, uh, how they're sequencing and structuring information appropriately and most importantly, coherently. And then we're focusing on the actual quality uh, within the sentences in terms of the accurate use of, it could be tense agreement, verb agreement, grammar, punctuation, and spelling in general. So I'm going to give you a few seconds to just have a look at that um, analysis that we've done based on the performance. Again, you might want to screenshot that. I think that is um, pretty self-explanatory. And again, um, particularly analysing the uh, principal examiner report, writing responses can be improved by. These are tips that we will be exploring in future sessions. We'll be doing some practical practice. <laughs> we'll be having a look at these together and sharing ideas for how we can make this really active learning for the students.
and it was mentioned yesterday we know that we know that teaching writing is difficult different genre we know that um we know that writing in our second language in many cases is difficult it's difficult enough writing in the first language never mind a second or a third or a fourth so uh we will be coming back to these things but hopefully that's given us a little taster of what we can try Okay, so that we don't need um, actually to go on here now. So if, just forgive me for just uh, flipping through because we've got the uh, resources on the um, in the actual meeting. Um, sample assessment materials, I've put those up, specifications. Bye for now. Thank you very much. And uh, I hope to see you very, very soon.